The great John Shea from the San Francisco Chronicle, our only national baseball writer in the San Francisco Bay Area, joins us here as his alma mater took down my alma mater on Saturday night. Oh, it was a rough one. How are you, John Shea? Yeah, when when you get a defensive tackle who's your quarterback or yeah. or safety or whatever the heck he was the last few years, and you just throw him in at quarterback, and he's the conference player of the week. That's not bad, right? Yeah, that is uh, that is true. And you know, when I think about what I saw this weekend, and I was just talking about it, and the NFL originally did not embrace gambling. The NFL originally did not like fantasy sports. They fought fantasy sports because they weren't making money off of it. CBSSports.com, Yahoo Sports. But somehow, as I was sitting in a casino for three days, John, and I watched how people are so locked into football, not on wins and losses, not on the team you grew. You're a 49er fan. These people are locked in on fantasy which guys do they have on each team? It's money on the game. There's so many different things that people are locked in that's not based on the actual game that we don't have in baseball, we don't have in the NBA. I don't know how we do it in baseball, but somehow we've got to figure out a way to get people interested on watching Mariners and A's on a Tuesday night, and it really has nothing to do with the outcome of the game. The GM meetings were in Vegas, and yep. I saw firsthand the sports book and, and all the TVs, and it, it's pretty heavy stuff. You know, the Diamondbacks have a uh, betting room just on the premises, and some other parks are adding that as well. Walk outside, walk 50 feet, go up to the window, and bet. Oh, for sure. But look where we are. Yeah, I'll never forget uh, our last trip to Japan was sponsored by MGM because they're doing the big thing there in Tokyo. They're building this gambling me- Eka outside of Tokyo. They sponsored our whole series of us being there with, with the Seattle Mariners. So I just there's got to be a way. I mean, I like the fact that we're going to try new rules. Some will work. Some won't. We can be we can adapt. I mean, that's what human beings do. Our game will adapt the way the other sports adapt. I like we're trying to speed up the game. But in the end, we got to find a way. I mean, all these high school kids now have fantasy teams. They got fantasy teams with their parents. I mean, these these leagues are bringing people together and sharing experiences. It's what we've got to strive to do. By the way, the general manager meetings, uh, you ran into David Forrest. What were your takeaway for the athletics down at the, at the, not the winter meetings, but at the GM meetings? Well, I think that payroll will go up. I think that they will go after some free agents, obviously low-level free agents, maybe for the first time in a couple of years or mid-level, whatever the case may be. And I think Sean Murphy is going to be traded. They have so much depth at the position with Shea Longoliers and Soderstrom and everyone down, Susak, um, McCann. You go pretty deep with the catching situation with Oakland. And if you need a third baseman, if you need – um, an outfielder, if you need, I mean, the rotation, a, a reliever or two, and you could get three guys, maybe a couple of them might be ready. And he actually said, rather than, you know, in, instead of all those uh, prospects that they got from all the trades, the three pitchers and the corner infielders, I think they're going to focus on getting major league players in response, in re, in return for So I think Sean Murphy might go this offseason. There's all kinds of buzz at the GM meetings. Molina is stepping aside in St. Louis, and some other teams are going to need someone behind the plate. It's sad to lose a guy like that. It's sad to trade a guy like that, but it's an easy way to fill holes uh, elsewhere on the roster. So no matter – I mean, what, he, he won a gold glove two years ago. This year he was a silver slugger finalist, one of the best young catchers in the game, and you have to trade him because – I mean, you just don't go out and get a judge or a Trey Turner uh, on the free agent market. That's not what Oakland has ever done. So this is the next best thing, trade your asset. And I think they could fill a couple of holes by moving him. And it does make sense, right? Like you think about it and you don't want to lose a guy, but you got to think a business is a business and, and you got to operate it that way. And you think that he's da- he's right in the middle of his prime 
you know you're not going to win right now. So having him in his prime years, uh, moving him for other pieces that can help you when you are starting to win, I, I see why teams would do that. It makes, uh, uh, from a standpoint of, well, he'd help you now. Well, you lost 102 games. You're probably, you know, <laughs> you could sign some guys and lose 95 next year. You can actually go get some good players for him that will help you in two, three, four years when you are starting to win again. And Langoliers came up at the perfect spot, right? And yeah. pretty good first name as well, Shay. Um, and <laughs> Stephen Vogt was there. You saw him all in the corner, all those catchers. It was Vogt. It was Langoliers. It was Murphy. And they were huddling every single day. So those young guys learned a lot from Vogt this year, especially down the stretch when all three of them were together. They traded thoughts. They traded insight. And oftentimes Vogt would just hold court. And those two young guys were just listening. So it's a great experience for the two young guys. And now Vogt is moving on. Um, they have a bench coach opening, but I think uh, Katze is going to get somebody uh, else. I think Vogt is looking at all kinds of possibilities, whether it's executive, whether it's broadcasting, whether it's coaching, managing in the minors, who knows. But um, uh, I haven't heard whether vote is front and center because they hadn't talked to him for that opening um, last week during the GM meeting. So um, they have a they have an opening to fill. But anyway, it, it's it, it's pretty it was pretty cool, right, to go in that clubhouse and see those catchers huddle in the corner like they always were. Yeah, I mean, they got a group that, you know, when we go position by position and we go by need, we just skip right over catcher and that discussion yeah. because we know there's there's a lot more coming. So that's going to be real interesting because you can only play one of them. So having a bunch of them doesn't do you a whole lot of good unless they can pick up other gloves and, and play somewhere else. When you were down there in Vegas, did you hear anything that surprised you? Oh, um, well, I, I think, I think, uh, you know, Scott Boris held court and yeah. he's got so many of the top end free agents. And I think, I think Aaron judge is going to help determine the value of a lot of these shortstops as crazy as that might sound. But if he gets, I don't know, eight or nine years and $300 million, you know, then you have the next level of shortstops, the four guys. You know, Bogarts and Trey Turner, um, you know, all the way down, Carlos Correa, uh, Dansby Swanson. And and those are some pretty good frontline shortstops. And all of them are in their 20s. Dansby, the youngest, and and Turner, and then uh, Correa is the second youngest, then Turner. So so uh, the, the, the thing is, what, what I hear the most, though, when talking – to agents uh, who don't represent these guys, because agents who represent those guys would play them up like, um, you know, they're going to make a difference in the organization big time. You're going to go from average to very good with one of these guys. But agents who don't represent those guys will tell you that if you look at the top 100 in anybody's list of prospects, it's just jam packed with shortstops. So everybody has one. The A's have a great one defensively anyway. Um, the Giants across the bay. Uh, with Luciano and Crawford moving eventually have one. So um, it, it's like, okay, everybody has a great shortstop coming up. Do you spend that much money on a shortstop? Because shortstop, one agent told me, is a is a young man's position. And Crawford's 35, coming up on 35. And, you know, Ripken and Jeter, those guys played forever. Ripken moved to third. But the thing is, eventually some of these shortstops are going to have to move. I don't see Bogarts playing shortstop forever. Um, he might have to move to a corner infield spot. And and Trey Turner can play anywhere. I mean, he can play center. He can play second. All these key positions he's able to. I see Correa as a real good fit for a lot of teams because he's like 27. And um, he's he's durable enough to help you you know, now and deep into the future. I think he could stay on short for a long time. But anyway, I, I, I think that's kind of it. I said, what, what's going to happen with the shortstop market? Because people behind the scenes says, you know, everyone's kind of got one or at least one coming up. And uh, these guys are going to be, you know, $100, $200 million players. Yeah, shortstop is like tight end in the NFL. You draft these guys, you draft the body type. 
knowing that you can move them. You know, if I draft a tight end, I could bulk him up, make an offensive lineman. I can slim him down, make him a wide receiver. He could play on the defensive side of the ball. Shortstop's the same way. We've seen shortstops go to center field. I mean, it's easy to say move them to third base. They can move all over the diamond because they're so athletic. So you draft a guy knowing that there's a lot of different guy, a lot of different places you can put them. So that's why you'll see a lot of shortstops in every single organization. It's a very good point. And, you know, when I start thinking about certain teams, I, I don't like, for me, business-wise, my father always told me, play your cards close to the vest. Don't let people know what you're thinking. But I understand the San Francisco Giants. They have always been very weary about how their fan base is feeling. I mean, obviously, when you put that gamble down on that ballpark, we all remember it as Pac Bell, and you're worried about, hey, are we going to be able to make this thing happen? Of course, they paid it off in record time. Everything's been great, three championships. But when their fan base is starting to criticize them, where's the star players? They didn't get the bump off 107 wins. Season tickets are down. Attendance is down. You know, they want that Bonds type guy. They want that star player. So they let it leak out that, and I don't know how it leaked out, but it got out and it had to come from them that they will not be outspent. Well, what happens if Aaron Judge resigns with the New York Yankees? What happens if Steve Cohen busts out a checkbook that no one else has? And he, I mean, are the Giants just letting that leak? So they kind of, are able to say, hey, we offered a lot of money, but they didn't take it. Or is this something they're really all in on? We're going to do everything we can to bring them here because they need a little sizzle on the stake. Well, I don't think they had to leak anything. Farhan Zaidi has been up front saying, we're going after all these high-end free agents. And he hadn't said that in previous years. He might have behind the scenes, but not publicly like he is now. I mean... He said in, in, in Las Vegas that uh, the resources should be able to pay for whatever is out there. And the resources are a plenty. I mean, they were 13th in payroll and they've been top four, top five team in payroll. And it just so happened that they're right about there in attendance. And they were also top four, top five in attendance. So what does that tell you? Well, you're not spending as much and now you're a 500 team and where's the superstar? The San Francisco Giants, I think last year was only the sixth year they did not have one of the following players. Sixth year since they moved in 1958. Willie Mays, Jack Clark, Will Clark, Barry Bonds, Buster Posey. So last year was the sixth year since 1958. One of those guys was not on their roster. So they've always been a superstar-driven team. Uh, they only won the three championships, not in the 60s or, or the 70s, but they were every bit as good as all those other National League teams in the 60s. They had the most wins in the decade. Marshall had the most wins. Uh, they finished second five great times. This was before the wild card and all that stuff. But you, you win the pennant, you go to the World Series. That was the playoffs. So there's an awful lot of funny money in that budget this year. And they're talking as much as they're apparently moving and grooving and dealing and wheeling and all this stuff. Um, you know, they've contacted Boris. I assume they've contacted the agent for judge and they have to go after a lot of guys because obviously it takes two to tango and all those cliches. Will judge want to come? Will Turner want to come? Well, judge could want to stay back East. Eventually he, he's kind of in an interview I did with him in late August kind of hinted, hey, you know, I grew up a Giants fan. I always wanted to be a Giant. You know, that changed when I was drafted by the Yankees, and now it's about business, and now you're a pro. You don't always want to go back to your hometown team. But his parents are a couple hours away. He's very close to the family. It's a little community out in Linden in the yeah. San Joaquin Valley. It's a small town, and everybody kind of rallies around him. They would love to his – his mother-in-law is still in the school district in Linden. I mean, we've heard, <laughs> we've heard all these things. It's amazing. Yeah, and it's 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 you have to go after him, but you have to go after at least a couple of these shortstop in case somebody doesn't uh, want to come here for whatever reason. And Turner, you know, we keep hearing he wants to go back east. It's either the Dodgers or bust on the west coast, and it doesn't seem like he's going back to the Dodgers anyway. Uh, 
you know, so a lot of teams are going to be in on these guys. So, but the, so the giants and they're losing Carlos um, Radon perhaps. So they even either have to re-sign him or get someone else to be at the top of the rotation with Logan Webb. You're a great person to ask because you were just down there. And I've been thinking about this because there was a great article in you in the USA today from our friend, Bob Nightingale about Dave Dombrowski and Dave getting another team to the world series. Dave really still bitter about the way he was fired in Boston. You have these teams that have a lot of money. We'll look at the Red Sox, look at the Giants, look at the Cubs, but really kind of the Red Sox and the Giants really wanted to go kind of money ball with money. Now, I always laugh when people bring up Moneyball because Moneyball was a necessity. Bean didn't have money. He had to do whatever he could do, scratch and claw. But now all of a sudden, what Heim Bloom was brought in, Farhan's brought in, you know, we're going to place Dombrowski. We're going to replace Larry Bear. I mean, um, Brian Sabian. <laughs> Not Larry Bear. Sorry, Larry. Uh, replace, <laughs> replace Brian Sabian. We're going to do the new school, kind of spin less. We're going to still win, spin less, make more. And, and that really, it hasn't worked. Did you get the sense, big market teams playing money ball, not flying right now. Dave Dombrowski let, made him look bad in Philly. And now that's when you hear Farhan saying, oh, now we're going to spin. Hein Bloom, now we need to spin. Are you getting the sense big market teams need to start acting like big market teams again? Yeah, baseball is so cyclical. If it doesn't work with analytics, let's hire Buck Showalter or Dusty Baker. Um, and if it uh, doesn't work with the old school mentality, uh, like the couple last years, uh, you know, with Bochi, well, let's get Farhan Zaidi and go the extreme other way. That's just the way it's always been. And I imagine it's always going to be that way. I mean, they love Dusty in Houston now, but you remember Houston was on the ground floor of a lot of these newfangled ways of doing things, uh, you know, on the level and sometimes not on the level, as we know now. But, you know, you look at that World Series and you look at the Phillies, it was spend, spend, spend. But the Astros was develop, develop, develop. I mean, it's a, quite a contrast of the two World Series teams. Dusty managed a team with a homegrown rotation other than Verlander, a homegrown infield, three out of four guys, a couple outfielders, guys in the, the rotation where you look at a lot of the stars on Philly and they had just signed them over the last couple of three years. So big money too. So which organization would you like to have? Well, you would like to have the Astros with the homegrown guys and then fill in with, with a Harper or whomever um, to round it out and to, to, to cement a superstar in the lineup. And, you know, right now, you know, the Giants aren't necessarily deep with homegrown talent. It was kind of a down year in the minor league system. All their top prospects were either hurt or ineffective. So we'll see what happens this coming year. But in the meantime, I think the fan base definitely wants to move on from mixing and matching and platooning. I think even Farhan Zaidi wants to do that too. It's always better to have regulars in your lineup. You don't have to have the big red machine of the 70s in Cincinnati. But as Bob Melvin told me, he went from Oakland to San Diego. The lineup pretty much was the same every day, maybe one platoon out in center field. But otherwise, you're paying all these guys so much money, you're not going to platoon them. And that's what worked for the Giants two years ago with all those wins and then didn't work this past year because nobody had career years like they all did the previous year. So a lot of things need to happen if you continue to mix and match and platoon and all that stuff, um, bullpen your way through a game. That doesn't always work, as we saw in the postseason. Bullpenning, one guy can ruin everything. And you rely on so many people to be perfect. It just doesn't work out so easily as, as it might, you know, in, 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 you know, on the computer. But anyway, it's, that's just a contrast. You'll love this. It was said on the show during the World Series. Ah, Philly, it's a blue collar team. And someone pointed out that's the most expensive blue collar team in the history of baseball. No question. Uh, tell me about the HBO Max. They got the documentary coming out. Say Hey, Willie Mays. Of course, your great book about Willie Mays, a tribute to one of the greatest players who has ever lived. So one of the greatest. Who is the greatest? Well, you know what's funny? We created all these analytics, right? Because these analytics were supposed to give us new answers. They created all these analytics. And the, skate, and the same guy's at the top of all these analytics. His name's Babe Ruth. 
You know, our friend Eno Saris, you know, Saris, who knows everything about analytics and all the modern day stats. Yeah. He's quoted in the book saying, you know, Willie could have won seven, eight or nine MVPs. He won two. But you look at his war. He led the National League in war every year, oftentimes leading the entire major leagues in war. And that's a stat that a lot of people base their MVP vote on, um, whether you like it or not. And who's the best player in the league? Well, let's see who's got the highest war. It's not a perfect stat. Um, it doesn't always gauge defense properly, uh, but it takes into account all of Willie's tools, hitting, hitting with power, base running, um, throwing, and fielding. And, I mean, you say Babe Ruth he could be the best. Well, he didn't have those five tools. He didn't defend or throw in the outfield like like Mays. I mean, yes, he pitched, but – you know, in the research for this book, there were a couple of Birmingham newspapers that projected Willie Mays was going to be a pitcher, not a hitter in the big leagues. That's how good of an arm he had. So if he pitched, hey, he might have been like the Babe as well. But, you know, it's not like the Babe is like Otani. He kind of pitched and then he hit. He didn't do this very long uh, simultaneously like the man in Anaheim. So anyway, when people say who's the greatest ever, I say, well, the greatest overall ever. And you could make an argument. Actually, I can't. I can't make an argument as to what his best tool is because the hitting is as good as his throwing, which is as good as his base running, which is good as defending, which is good as his power game. So it's pretty amazing. And the film touches on this, but it also touches on a lot of behind the scenes um, anecdotes and storytelling from Willie's life and career that might not have otherwise been told i did in the book and now it's out on screen the big screen or your little screen on your phone or the big screen in your pad <laughs> whatever you might have um it's an hour and 40 and I, I i really love the concept of it it's a fabulous film it really uh embraces and um dissects willie's life and career and you know his life and uh, exemplary life and the, the way he lived and the inspiration um it's a huge word for Willie because he was inspired by so many people early on from his dad, Willie Howard May Sr., to Leo DeRocher, to Bill Greeson and all his Negro League teammates, to Piper Davis, his manager in Birmingham, and then and then Monty Irvin, his first teammate, a Negro League legend with the uh, New York Giants. And then he came to San Francisco in 58, and he wasn't considered the guy who was being mentored all the time. He was the guy who was mentoring because there's a young Willie McCovey and there's a young Orlando Cepeda. Years later, a young Bobby Bonds, the Alou brothers. So from then till now, he's been inspiring millions. So this kind of details that journey. What's it like for you, though? Enough about Willie Mays. What about you? <laughs> I mean, it's your work, right? I mean, what what is that like to see it? It's one thing to read it. What's it like to see it? It's It's... I mean, the book was a project of a lifetime, and then this film is like part two of a project of a lifetime. I mean, I'm I'm blessed and lucky and fortunate, all those things that I was even able to develop a relationship with the great Willie Mays because of my access and my presence and my storytelling of the Chronicle. And, and then when I asked him about a book, like long, long time ago, he said, I'd like to see it in classrooms. So he took it inspirationally and young adults, but it's Willie May. So all generations and, um, you know, from, from nine to 90 or whatever, plus, um, would be interested in hearing about Mays because everyone's got a Willie May story. I mean, there were a thousand people in the audience at the premiere at the Castro a couple of days before it came out on HBO. And I guarantee everybody in the crowd had a Willie May story. And when I reached out to people for comments about Willie for the sake of the book and teammates, Negro League legends, managers, commissioners, presidents, musicians, artists, everybody called back. As opposed to maybe when I ask comment on a story I'm doing for the Chronicle, if you get five out of 10 people responding to your query, that's a good day. But with Mays, you, you bat a thousand. It's pretty amazing. Well, it also takes me back to if Willie never leaves New York. If certain play, if certain Dodger players never leave New York, and that gets me back to where we started this thing, 
You know, if you're a good team, let's say the Cincinnati Bengals, they'll never call you a small market team. Now, if you're a good team, you're the Cincinnati Reds, same city, now you're a small market team. We've got to figure out how to not be so regional. We've got to figure out how to not be talking about big markets, small markets. Because, yeah, Willie Mays' greatness shouldn't have mattered that it got lost once he moved to San Francisco and a lot of people, obviously, a different time. We didn't have cable television. We didn't have packages where we can watch every game. We didn't have these things, cell phones. I mean, that's the one thing that no matter where you play, I mean, Julio Rodriguez today, John, is going to win the rookie of the year in the American League, and he pl- he plays in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> We've got to figure out how eyeballs are on him throughout the entire season and just not when his team shows up to play against the Yankees and the Red Sox in the Northeast. Hmm. How do you do that, though? I mean, you mentioned uh, what if Willie Mays never left New York? How about this one? What if, what if Willie Mays didn't sign with the Giants? You know, his dad said he couldn't sign anywhere with a big league team. And this was three years after Jackie Robinson broke in in 1950 when he graduated high school. The Yankees were there. The Red Sox were there. The Boston Braves were there. The Giants were there, of course. And the Brooklyn Dodgers were there. I mean, he was recommended by Jackie Robinson to the front office because Jackie came by on a barnstorming tour and visited Rickwood Field. And he saw a young Willie Mays. He said, hey, you should check this kid out. As I say in the film, a a scout named Wid Matthews visited Birmingham, spent a couple of days scouting young Willie Mays and came back to Brooklyn. And his scouting report was the kid can't hit a curveball. So imagine if he came back with, hey, you know what? We should sign this guy. And you can't hit a curveball was kind of code for the color of a skin doesn't work for us because we already got a quota of two or four. Back then, you had you didn't have one or three because African American players roomed together. They didn't stay in the same hotel, you know. Didn't take the team bus. Didn't eat in the same restaurant. So there were only two and four because they roomed together, you know, somewhere else. And so the Dodgers had their quota. So Willie Mays can't hit a curveball. But imagine that the Dodgers might not have lost a game in the '60s. Well, think about Hank Aaron. If he's playing in the Northeast and not playing for the Braves as a guy who at one point had the most home runs, most RBIs, and a lot of people don't think about this, the third most hits. Only Pete Rose and Ty Cobb had more hits than the great Hank Aaron, and he was very good defensively. What if Willie and Hank were both playing in the Northeast their entire career? Yeah, and I I think Hank was real close to signing with the New York Giants, but it was only a few dollars difference, and and the Braves offered a little more. I mean, listen, the Northwest, they didn't they have uh, the big unit and, and Griffey and A-Rod, A-Rod together at some yeah. point? I mean, yeah. they were pretty darn good. They were really the talk of baseball. But it, it's harder because free agents don't want to go to Seattle. In the NBA, they might not want to go to Sacramento. It, it's kind of far off the beaten path. And you can only get so much if you – you know, unless you outspend everybody, but it's not like Seattle's outspending everybody like the Mets will or the Yankees will or the Dodgers will. And let's bring this full circle and take it back to Christmas. I like a good gift for A's fans. Long shot, building homes, dreams, and baseball teams. Steve Shot, the book you did about the former owner of the Oakland Athletics, I think for a generation of A's fans, the 2000s, right? Moneyball team. All those players are so beloved. When we just celebrated them this year, the 2002 team, it was very emotional for A's fans. You know, we can talk about the 70s, but, you know, there's a lot of people in our fan base that weren't alive then. I mean, like my man Cody here, who is a producer for the A's, he doesn't remember 88, 89, and 90. He was a baby. I mean, that was when I was in high school. That's my that's my guys, right? I mean, when I get to do TV with Dave Stewart, I'm like, wow, it's Dave Stewart. <laughs> but, for, but for a lot of our fans, it's that group of Giambi, Tejada, Hudson, Mulder, and Zito, Chavez, and all those guys. And your book is about that era. So I think for A's fans, you're always looking. I always mention this. You're looking for a really good Christmas gift. Long shot, building homes, dreams, and baseball teams. 
the Steve Shot story, your book, I think would be great for people to give away as gifts for A's fans for Christmas. Well, thanks, Chris. And it's it's uh, yeah, it's it's long shot. It's it, it take off on his name, but it's also deep with the Oakland A's. Always a long shot. Always overcoming the odds. Always getting more bang for their buck. And it kind of tells an inside inside story that neither the Moneyball book nor movie did with Paul D. Podesta, who you know, in the movie wasn't Paul T. Podesta because he didn't even want his name attached. But for the book, he writes an amazing forward. And he puts it all out there and explains that he and Billy Bean were given the task of designing a roster with a, you know, a certain amount of parameters and budget because Schott and Hoffman bought the team from the Haas family, which wasn't real big on budgets. So it was... Um, turned into more of a business plan. So there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff that that people really didn't know about. I didn't even know about and I covered the team that was uncovered about Lon Simmons. Um, and, you know, he got a, he got kind of a raw deal there because everyone blamed him and he is to blame shot. But <laughs> the funny story there is he never wanted Lon Simmons fired. You know, Lon Simmons said in a newspaper story before the season, before, you know, right after his final season in Oakland that he wanted to cut back on games played. And then Schott's uh, team president at the time, and it wasn't Sandy Alderson, called him up and said, okay, we're moving in another direction. And Schott said, wait a minute, no, no, we didn't want that. We just wanted fewer games, like Lon said in this newspaper article. So it was, it was you know, it, he, he got a lot of bad PR for some good reasons. He wasn't used to meeting with the media all the time about baseball. He was, uh, you know, he, he, he built homes and, and, you know, nobody has big press conferences if you build homes. So <laughs> anyway, you know, it's kind of a, it was kind of a rags to riches story about a guy who had 500 bucks in his pocket when he got married and then went on to donate more than a hundred million dollars of charity and buy a baseball team. He, he has the winningest record of any A's owner in history going back to Philly and Kansas city and even Finley and the Haas family doesn't measure up with his winning percentage. If you remember, they contended six straight years after really scuffling those first two years. And he kind of pushed for, you got to, you got to draft more pitchers. We, you know, we can't have Van landing them out, out, not Van landing them. Who am I thinking of the uh, uh, Van Poppel? Sorry. <laughs> Neither amounted to much Van Poppel. Was out Van there. Poppel. Yeah. And, and that was like the face of the future. He said, no, man, we got to go different direction. So, you know, uh, Hudson, Mulder, Zito, and all those years later, they developed quite a staff. And and same with Giambi and same with Tejada. Speak about homegrown talent. I mean, the A's had it at that at that point, but obviously lost the two MVPs to free agency and eventually traded a couple of the pitchers, and we know that story. But this has a lot deeper, um, you know, into the business practices, into the baseball practices, uh, uh, a lot of family background. So it kind of touches on a lot of things. Also an inspirational read, like the Maze book. Well, congratulations on everything. HBO, books, you name it. Of course, reading you in the San Francisco Chronicle. We always appreciate it because you're our national baseball writer. You're giving us stuff nobody else is. And, of course, great stuff from the GM meetings in Vegas. We're going to be getting the same stuff. We'll be there in San Diego down at the winter meetings. We know we'll see you there. Good stuff, and uh, let's go sell some books. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Good seeing you guys. Take care, buddy. The great John Shea from the San Francisco Chronicle does an unbelievable job.